Hi, my name is Peter Beinart. I'm a fellow at the Foundation for Middle East Peace and really excited um, to be joined today for this uh, episode of um, Occupied Thoughts by Ben Rhodes, um, who I'm sure most of you know. Ben is uh, the former uh, Deputy National Security Advisor in the Obama administration. He's also uh, the co-host of Pod Save the World, a contributor for, MS for NBC and MSNBC, uh, the co-chair of National Security Action, and the author of the soon-to-be-released book, After the Fall, Being American in the World we made, We've Made. Uh, ben, thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Peter. Sorry, I, I got my bio's a little long. I got to uh, no, no, no. <laughs> That's great to be with you. You know, you're 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 busy. I mean, I, I follow a lot of stuff you do, so I can tell how busy you are. Um, I, you know, there's a ton that I would love to talk to you about. Um, uh, just because I, um, you know, one of the things I find so interesting about you is that I feel like you were someone who was able to see American foreign policy both from the inside and the outside because you, you know, and it reminds me. You know, I did this piece like a year ago about whether America intervenes in other countries' elections. It was obviously in response yeah. to that. And I've called all these like people who had worked in the Obama administration and they were all like, no. I mean, sure, we, we've done bad things in the past, but basically like there's a pretty fundamental distinction between how we operate and how other countries operate. And then I called all these academics who work on like Latin America and other things and they're like, are you crazy? Of course we do all that stuff, you know? And it just, it was for me just one of these moments where I realized yeah. these are people who had gone to the same kind of schools. They were the same demographics, but like they saw the world. And one of the things I find yeah. really yeah. fascinating about your journey is I feel like you have had this experience of both in and outside being in government and being outside of government. And I feel like I particularly wanted to ask you about how that's, what that's like on this question of Israel. Um, yeah. I know it's something you care a lot about and is maybe uh, one of those areas where there's this like really big discrepancy between kind of like official Washington discourse and the discourse you sometimes hear in other places. Um, and I wanted to just ask you a little bit like from your own personal experience, how is working on Israel policy when you're in the White House different than, than working on policy for other, for other countries? Yeah, well, Peter, um... You know, I think, it, look, it's it's different um, in, in a lot of ways. Um, first of all, you you meet more with outside organized uh, constituency groups on Israel than any other foreign policy issue. And I'd actually go as far to say that you, know, you probably meet as a senior White House official working on national security, the, the number of people who you meet from kind of the organized pro-Israel community it equals all the other meetings that you might do <laughs> with kind of diaspora or constituency groups on all the other issues. It's that degree of, uh, of just dwarfing, you know, and, and I'm speaking about the Obama experience. I'm pretty confident that that's a consistent thread across administrations. So number one, you just have this incredibly organized pro-Israel community that is very accustomed to having access in the White House, in Congress, at the State Department, you know, it's kind of taken as granted, as given that that's gonna be the way things are done. I think secondly, the degree of congressional interest, um, again, dwarfs any other issue that I worked on in the Obama years. Um, and so anything with a nexus to Israel, uh, be it uh, Iran or the Palestinian issue, the two dominant ones in our, our time, you, you know, you're gonna hear from members of Congress, you're gonna be expected to be briefing members of Congress if there's any daylight between the US and the Israeli government, even democratic members of Congress are going to be upset, concerned about that. Um, uh, and then lastly, like the, the, the media uh, uh, interest is dramatically intensified. And that's both a very uh, aggressive kind of pro Likud uh, uh, media in the United States. Um, it, it's also just the mainstream media that delights in Israel controversies. You know, so Netanyahu knew that not only could he kind of gin up the right-wing pro-Likud media in the United States, which is pretty vast, um, but he also knew that if he needed Obama, he would create a you know, week-long political story. And you know, because the, 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 the political reporters view Israel as a, as a domestic political issue, not as a foreign policy issue. So, so in all those ways, the outside pressure, the congressional interest, the media interest, there's just a much greater spotlight on anything with a nexus to Israel than, than anything else. Um, and inevitably, 
that weighs on the minds of of politicians and policymakers. So you can't you can't act like it doesn't. So let me just ask you, like maybe this is a this is an obvious question. I'm just going to say, how often do you get requests or do you have meetings with representatives of like the pro Palestinian side? So um, I would. <laughs> I would be the one to take those meetings. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I actually did like a quite, you know, pretty regularly. Not, I wouldn't say, but here's the thing. Um, usually with me, in those types of meetings were either like peace groups. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, sometimes Christian religious groups, Quakers mm -hmm. and others uh, advocating for peace. Sometimes they were kind of Arab American constituency mm -hmm. groups. So mm -hmm. less kind of Palestinian but, but but more broadly Arab American. So there really is not, there wasn't like a significant, you know, just just Palestinian or Palestinian American kind of organized constituency that you would meet with. You meet with either pro-peace folks or, um, or, or the Arab, uh, Arab American community. And look, frankly, I, I think that, you know, um, I end up taking those meetings because like, I mean, not everybody wants to take those, you know, um, uh, because you know the you can get into you know trouble if you're seen as um, you know solicitous. Uh, I mean, I got I would get creamed in the right wing press, right? For for I, I spoke at NIAC, the the Iranian American yeah. group, right? Uh, not on the Palestinian issue, but on obviously the Iran nuclear deal, and, and uh, you know I still you think I. <laughs> you know, I get the supreme leader of Iran, Peter, you know, like, and, and, and so that there's a kind of chilling effect, you know, you are expected, every senior U.S. government official is, is kind of, and national security is like almost expected to turn up at APAC. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not expected to turn up at NIAC, you know, um, and, uh, and that, that's the, the common, thing. I'll say one other, uh, uh, just to name something, Peter, uh, um, I remember being in a meeting once on early in the Obama years on, um, on Israel, and I, I again, I, I, the balancing act we always have to do. Uh, I, I'm not. I, I think you know. Just I'm just acknowledging something. I'm not suggesting there's anything kind of inherently wrong with it. It just is what it is. I remember looking around a room in this uh, the Situation Room uh, on a meeting on an Israel-Palestine issue, and every single one of us in the meeting mm -hmm. was Jewish um, mm -hmm. or of Jewish kind of origin, like me. I'm obviously right. not uh, practicing. Um, which again, I don't want to sound conspiratorial. Right. I'm not right. trying to advance right. a trope. Right. Um, I'm really not. Like, right. I right. think it's great that, that a lot of Jewish Americans go into to foreign policy right. and security. But right. I just remember thinking, you know, right. what, what if the all, everybody in this room right. is an Arab American? Like, right. you have a different, uh, you know. So, right. so let's not pretend like there's not some, you know. Right. There's right. We all bring our own experience to these. We exactly. all bring our experience. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. We understand the Israeli fears right. and right. grievances and concerns intuitively right. as Jewish Americans, maybe not as much as Israelis, I don't want to claim that, but we have some understanding with it in a kind of our, 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 our unconscious, literally, in a way yeah. that I just, I, I, intellectually, I can try to understand the Palestinian experience, but I don't. Yeah. So I, talk to me a little bit about what these meetings, the, the, you know, um, and again, I think it's, I just also want to make it clear. I think neither you nor I believe there's some, you know, vast, you know, conspiracy, you know, protocols of the elders of Zion conspiracy, right? The American Jewish community is a community that's been around the United States for a long time. It's a well-organized community. Um, it's a community that 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 um, is politically articulate uh, and it's able to advocate well for the things that, you know, as as we would wish every community could could be. But, um, um, but, um, but as you say, it has an impact on policy. And I would love to know a little bit about what these meetings are like. You're saying, you know, you have, there, there are tons and tons of meetings with pro-Israel organizations uh, um, and, and like they come in, I presume they have kind of an agenda generally, like, like what, what are those meetings are like and what would you say are the effect, ten, what, you know, what, what, do they, what do you then come away from those meetings? How do they affect policy? And maybe they don't. Um, you know, I, I, I think part of what's interesting to me over time is that, um, you know, over the years I, I met so many times with like, you know, the usual suspects, right? You know, the, um, from the organized American Jewish community. And part of what you start to realize is well, well, this is a pretty small number of people. You know, the, the American yeah. Jewish community is a large, right. sprawling, raucous, right. wonderful right. community. And, right. and, and, and it's kind of like 10 to 20 people that you find yourself right. meeting with all the time. Right. 
Right. And, and some of whom were, by the way, are wonderful people, some of whom uh, less so. Um, <laughs> um, and, and, and look, you know, uh, what, what, again, mm -hmm. it's not a conspiracy. It is what it is. People are advocating position. But, but you know, it, it's a common position. Whatever the, whatever the tension point between us and the Israeli government was at a given time, they were usually coming in to represent what I already knew to be the Israeli government's view in that circumstance. Mm -hmm. um, there was a big push at the beginning of the Obama administration after Netanyahu's election for the United States to, to recognize Israel kind of formally as a Jewish state, which, which actually had not been US policy before mm -hmm. uh, 2009. Um, there was a big push on the, us to pressure the Palestinians into talks, even though it wasn't clear that those talks were gonna to lead anywhere. Whenever there was a, um, a, an international incident like the Goldstone Report or the Turkish mm -hmm. flotilla, um, you, you have to you know, make sure that you're doing everything you can at the UN to, to kind of block this from going forward. Uh, but I would also get kind of advice you know, um, uh, on, on how to talk about uh, mm -hmm. these issues. And I remember, you know, to give you an example, they'd complain that we didn't, we, we, we dealt more with Palestinian grievances than, than Israeli grievances, which I did not think was the case, frankly. And one of, one of these people said to me, well, yeah, you're right, Ben, because I'd showed him all the things we said about um, you know, Israel's legitimate security concerns, for instance, and its history. And then he said, but you know, you put the Palestinians second. So it suggests that you think they're more important. You flip the order. I mean, we get very specific, you know, and language that Obama needs to use, reassurances that he needs to give. And then the nuclear deal was insane. I mean, I, I uh, the, the, the number of armchair centrifuge experts, you know, and, and that would get a little frustrating because, you know, we have nuclear scientists in the government and I've got <laughs> somebody from an organi organization like yelling at me about advanced centrifuge technology. And I'm like, I think Ernie Moniz understands this, you know, um, <laughs> but, it, but, but you could tell that, again, it's not a conspiracy because other groups do the same thing on their issues, just not as effectively, frankly, but you could tell that, that somebody else had brief them, you know, in, mo in most instances. It, it, and whether that was the Israeli government, their own staff, I'm not suggesting, I'm just saying that like, you can tell when you're meeting with someone who's kind of there to press a case. Um, and, and in this case, it was always whatever Netanyahu's um, priorities or, uh, or differences with Obama at the moment were. You mentioned just a minute ago that, you know, a lot of the people, sometimes you would find that a lot of people, you know, who worked on this issue were, Jewish. I remember asking once, like when I was writing my book um, of a former Obama administration official who was not Jewish, I said to her, like, what's it like when you're talking about these issues and there are no Jews in the room? And she's like, oh, that very rarely happens. You know, um, she's like, um, and I guess I just wondered if you feel like, you know, if you feel like it is different working on this issue, if you're Jewish or if you're not, and whether you feel at all like the, the folks who are not Jewish, feel sometimes like they may need to take a back a step back or they they may not feel as comfortable dealing with it sometimes because as you know it's as, as you know it's sensitive even if you it's difficult even if you are jewish but it's that more challenging sometimes if you're if you're not yeah it's a really good question i um i i think that there is a a, a kind of sense that i mean look i'll give the obvious example right like um Congress. Mm -hmm. um, I would brief uh, throughout the Iran process, the Jewish Democrats in Congress, that was a group, you know, and, mm -hmm. and Sandy Levin, wonderful man, like just yeah, yeah. phenomenal human being, mm -hmm. would pull it together. Mm -hmm. And it was, it wasn't subtle, you know, like, I was going up uh, every few weeks to brief every Jewish Democrat, which is a pretty sizable group, mm -hmm. about the particularities of the Iran negotiations. Mm -hmm. And and by the way, there was a Jewishness to it. Like we had bagels, you know, like, I mean, um, and, and, um, and so I think there's a kind of default to an assumption that you need um, like kind of to be informed by something of a Jewish perspective. But then even in that, I, I sensed, you know, I'm not a practicing Jew. I, I sensed at times a bit of a vibe of like, well, who are you to, you know, <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, and I was called uh, like a fake Jew, I, I, like this kind of, you know, there were these narratives of Jewishness that kind of informed uh, this stuff. 
But I think that Peter, the, the interesting development, right, in the last 20 years is the Christian evangelical community's kind mm. of complete embrace of, of, mm. of the most right-wing brand of Israel, uh, Israeli politics. It kind of actually shrunk the space in a way for the Jewish debate that usually happens around Israel, right? Mm. Because those people coming to see me knew they had a Republican party that was right. just gonna be in total lockstep, total hawks, right. total, you know, wherever Netanyahu was, and so be, debates about Israel policy became entirely debates inside the Democratic Party instead mm -hmm. of being, you know, because there used to be pretty healthy Republican debates right. about this stuff. Right. Right. And so that weirdly, the, the kind of evangelical firewall, if you will, of support for Israel really empowered the more conservative, and I mean that in political sense, more right wing Jewish perspectives in the American Jewish community, because they knew they had this cavalry behind them of the entire Republican Party. Um, and so what was weird is even though these were often debates with, you know, Jews in the room, um, the, the, uh, the presence that wasn't in the room was very powerful, which was the evangelical Christian movement, which gave them again, like a kind of a, literally to pardon the pun, a Trump card, um, that, that, you know, if, if, if the Democrats didn't, you know, fall on the line around a certain position, they knew that the Republicans could bludgeon us with it. And obviously that's the story of the whole Iran fight. Right. Right. Another thing that you've written about, I think, has been you've talked about, I think, is really important, um, uh, and it, is the way in which sometimes race may play into this, and there may be certain assumptions about um, that it may be that much more challenging if you're black, let's say, you know. And I remember just myself once, you know, at the shul we used to go to in Washington, someone making some passing comment about, how, "Oh, Susan Rice is the anti-Israel person in the administration." I was like. Really? Like, has she ever done anything? And I, I was like, what? I mean, what is she? I'm like, almost like, I wish you, I mean, and, but I just, and I get it reminded me of something that you've said about some of the ways that you felt like Obama was perceived. And I, I wondered, you know, working for a black president, if you could talk about what you feel like it's, if you feel like there are special challenges that, that face black uh, policymakers as they, as they deal with this issue. One million percent. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, look, Obama said this to me you know, uh, many times that, that basically he was, he, he was expected to somehow prove mm. something that a white politician would not have to prove. And, you know, the, the, and look, some of this is, you know, he had, you know, he was friends in the University of Chicago, right, in Chicago right. with Rashid Khalid, but like, um, but like the, he also came out of the Chicago Jewish community. You know, like he right. was a pretty conventional mainstream right. Democrat right. on Israel issues, right. uh, and and yet the expectation was he always had to go the extra mile. In the campaign, there were all these whisper campaigns about him. Right. You know, there were ads, you know, re re shadowy ads. He's going to sell out Israel. Um, he had to go to synagogues in a way that I think goes went beyond uh, what a white politician had to do because he'd have to go to the synagogue and like kind of convince them that he he understood Israel in a way that I don't think is is the commonplace. And the phrase that we heard over and over and over again right. from kind of APAC types was, well, we have to know that he feels in his kishkas, right? And I, I, I they thought- No one even uses the phrase kishkas, except when they're talking about whether people love Israel enough. I'm so sick of that phrase, but anyway, go ahead. No, no, exactly. But it was, it was they thought they were giving us kind of good advice, but it, no, it was borderline offensive because it was like- you know, three years in the administration, after he's done all these things for Israel, we're still being told that it's not clear that he feels in the kishkas. Um, and, and yeah, you know, Susan had uh, similar hurdles. Um, and, and, and look, you couldn't escape the kind of awkward fact. What I came to realize is, is part of what was threatening was that Obama as a black man right. was lived in an oppressed uh, community in this country, a marginalized community in the United States. And so therefore the assumption underlying that skepticism right. from the Jewish right. community is, well, then he's therefore clearly gonna empathize with the Palestinians because they are treated I know. in a marginalized way. And because Israel. they're so, oppressed. Because they're <laughs> oppressed. Because they're, <laughs> so what was so uh, awkward about it is that like, the thing that they were assuming, that right. by the way, might be true, right? Like right. They, they, yes. they, might be, they might be right. They might be onto something there. Obama understands the Palestinian experience in a way that right. a white right. person couldn't. Right. Kind of exposes like right. their vulnerability, right? right. And, 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 and so this was a constant subtext. And, and, um, and then he also, I think, really um, 
would 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 resent accusations of anti-Semitism that occasionally came his way, um, mm -hmm. as if he doesn't understand prejudice, you know. Um, and so, um, so, so it was it was definitely complicated. And, and I, I guess the thing that kind of bugged me too was um, the there was a kind of um, it, well, uh, the example I give this is when I was planning the trip to Israel that mm -hmm. Obama took. Uh, Michael Warren was the ambassador at the time. Um, I've subsequently learned not a huge fan of mine. And um, <laughs> Never mind. He, um, he planned kind of the schedule. I mean, he'd come in mm -hmm. and we'd kind of go through what Obama was going to do while he was in Israel. We wanted it to be a resident trip that, that did, you know, that spoke to different pieces of Israeli society. So we're going to go to the Israel Museum for kind of the history, but we're going to do like an entrepreneurship thing to get at the Startup Nation stuff. And, and, and Oren was adamant that, that Obama visit like this Ethiopian mm -hmm. Jewish community. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and I kept saying, no, it's fine. Like we're, we, we, love, <laughs> we love the Ethiopian community there, but like we, we just kind of out of the way. Right. And as time, after time, it's like, well, why? There's like a tokenism to it that, uh -huh. I, that uh -huh. I was like, why would you want the black president to go right. you know, right. take pictures with the black Jews? It felt there's a tokenism that creeps into the way in which they try to address this issue. Mm -hmm. um, that also was was at times present. Hmm. So you made a really, I think, really interesting, important point, which is the sense that like the reason that black politicians might be particularly scary on this issue is because there's an assumption that they may, because of their own experience, identify with Palestinians who are oppressed. And that in that, in that fear itself is a recognition that there <laughs> is a problem, right? And yeah. it makes me wonder in all of these meetings that you had with the Jewish representatives and the members of Congress. Did, did, was there ever like a fourth wall moment where you ever, or was there ever a moment where you like got the sense that maybe some of these folks who were pushing you didn't always believe everything they were saying? Yeah, um, I, I mean, the uh, two moments, right? One with the Palestinians, I started with Palestinian. And it, mm -hmm. like, we met with a group of Palestinian kids in mm -hmm. Ramallah. And it was just, mm -hmm. I was the only staffer in the room it was me and, and Obama and Michael Ratney, who was our, our CG in Jerusalem at the time. And every one of these Palestinian kids had an experience of the occupation that was just gut-wrenching to hear. I mean, I wish people would just sit in the room and listen to that for like an hour. You, I, it's impossible to walk out of that room and come out right. not thinking what, what, what is going on here. Um, and the last kid sat there and he looked angry the whole time. And you know, just pissed, not at all flattered that Obama was even meeting with them. And when it got to him, you know, he had this story, it was some horrible story, you know, and I don't remember what the exact story was, you know, detentions, Israeli IDF soldiers like quartered in his home, couldn't take his exams because, you know, whatever the thing was. And then he looked at Obama and he said, we are treated the same way in this country mm -hmm. that the black people used to be treated in your country. Mm -hmm. Um, and he paused and he said, financed by your government, Mr. Mm -hmm. President. And it was just like the direct shot to the mm -hmm. solar plexus, you know? Right. And I right. remember Obama was just silent on the, you know, like, so he got it, right? Um, but in terms of like the, yeah, I, I would get, look, like, on, it would come up a lot uh, on Iran and uh, on, uh, to some extent on Palestine. Because on Iran, mm -hmm. you know, I would go up to meet with members and, I'd have members trying to talk to me about the PMD, right? This is a very specific issue. The investigation of the possible military dimensions of Iran's nuclear program at a certain facility, Parchin, where the, the work you know, we assessed had ended, not just we, the Bush administration assessed on weaponization of nuclear weapons had ended a long, you know, years and years ago. And I've got members of Congress talking to me about what the inspections regime needs to be at Parchin, like some of whom are experts, but some of whom, bless are like don't, they don't know why, you know, like what traces of isotopes you're looking for. I mean, the, the, the talking points would get so specific on Iran that yeah. you knew that, that, that yeah. this was, and you were hearing, you were talking about echo chambers, which is what got, you know, obviously hung on me. This was such an echo chamber, you know, because like every member you're meeting with just con conspicuously happens to be obsessed with like the, the inspections regime right. at Parchin, right. you know, like, right. um, and so something like that would happen where you would sense that 
you know, obviously that everybody's working off of a set of points and some people understood the points and some people didn't, they just got them (laughs) before the meeting. Um, And then, and then on Palestinian issues, like, you know, there was a deeper understanding because I think just the issues have been around for longer. But I do remember being in a couple of meetings where um, Obama was, you know, in some dust up with Netanyahu. I remember being in a meeting and I won't say who, what group or who it was with, but like, um, when you know, uh, then Yao had made some pretty racist comments at the end of his campaign. You know, the Arabs are voting in droves. I think this is like 2016, yeah. and you know, Josh Ernest had been kind of critical at the podium, right. and they were the, the, a member of Congress was complaining to me about this, and um, and and I'm like, what what do you want us to do? <laughs> <laughs> well, the guy is, you know, is being a racist. He right. can't come out against the two-state solution now. He's talking about the errors voting in droves, and we're asked what we think about it. You know, right. how can we not give an answer that you know that is somewhat honest? And and he said, well, "Why can't you just blame the Palestinians?" <laughs> um, and I was like, "For what?" And he's like, I'm "Voting in droves." And, right. and he and he started talking about like incitement and 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 you know, and, and but it was like the 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 pivot was right was not subtle you know um and so stuff like that would happen and it was a fourth wall moment because most of the time actually it's not like that it's like you know earnest you know albeit often conservative views um and every now and then though something like that would happen where you're like okay we're all we're actually having the discussion here you know um i mean the last one i'll say here is on iran like you know, the, the members would call me at, at the beginning of the August recess in 2015 when we're heading in the Iran fight and be like, APEC put out a press release saying they're going to spend $40 million like on ads, like, you know, on this, like the money issue became acute. And people started to say, APEC told me they'd cancel my fundraisers if I vote this way. You know, like we were never supposed to name the right. issue of money. Right. But like, when it became very acute and APEC spending money and threatening people that they're going to cancel fundraisers, suddenly you're having that conversation in a way right. that you weren't even allowed to kind of allude to it um, in, in normal circumstances. Right. I mean, it's crazy because some of the same people who will fr- easily openly acknowledge that American politics is corrupt because of the way in which money influences everything also feel like you know it's anti-Semitic to, to mention it in this context, right? I mean, if it's true in general, it's true for this, right? It, I mean, well, yeah, that, that's the point. It's true for everything. And the the right. fossil fuel industry has been, you know, right. pretty well successful. The gun industry has been pretty successful. It's not a, a, right. a Jewish specific thing. Right. It just right. happens to be that I think the combination of of of, of money and, and 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 passion, right, um, an organization coupled with this evangelical peace that has emerged in the last several decades um, that is not about Jews, right, obviously, um, except the evangelicals want to convert them to, to rapture. Um, uh, you know, that's made this as, you know, one of the most powerful uh, lobbying uh, entities uh, or, you know, collectives, but it's not unique. It's, you know, there's a lot of, of them up there. Right. We don't have too much time, but I, I wanted to ask about the Biden administration. So, yeah. You know, from my perspective, you know, uh, it's been a uh, it's been a little depressing the uh, the way they've been handling Israel Palestine stuff. Not maybe surprising, but you know, they've kind of they've they've basically uh, I think the ambassador nominee to be the head of the UN said that BDS is borderline, nearly verging on anti-Semitic. You know, um, uh, of course, Biden has been very clear that there's no uh, no conditions under which they would condition military aid, regardless of what Israel does. There's this new statement now that basically they don't believe that the ICC, International Criminal Court, has jurisdiction. They, they, they've, they've basically accepted this International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism, which, as I think you've talked about, I think could be you could be de- uh, interpreted as, as defining basically, you know, anti any criticism right. of the idea of Jewish. So, I guess the question I want to ask you, without getting you in trouble, is you know these folks. Um, I mean, and you you like these folks. These are your friends. Yeah. They're good yeah. people. I mean, they seem to me good people. How much, frankly, do you think they believe this stuff? Do you think this is they're, these the positions are what they genuinely believe, or like what is it? What is what's going on? I think that um, you know on the on on some of these issues, 
Look, I like because I, I share your concern that, 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 that this is a pretty unsettled collection mm. of things mm. that are being done to completely delegitimize criticism of Israel and the occupation at a time when de facto annexation is happening and to kind of make BDS the new front, the new culture war issue uh, on, on this stuff. And um, on the one hand, I think that if you were to present any one of these individual issues to most of the senior Biden people, mm -hmm. they would, on that issue, mm -hmm. understand, you know, be able to, to, to intellectually occupy the position of, yes, Israel should not be singled out for criticism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, yes, BDS is bad and dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, and, and so there's a rationalization that happens uh, mm -hmm. issue by issue without look stepping back and mm -hmm. looking at kind of what is happening here. Um, that's one point I'd make. The second point I'd make, though, is that on the Israeli government, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, come on, Th these guys were in with me. Netanyahu mm -hmm. made our lives hell every mm -hmm. day that he could. Mm -hmm. And every one of those people in the Biden administration know that, you know, mm -hmm. that, 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 that we were treated with no respect, that Netanyahu undermined Obama, that he you know, made an agreement behind Obama's back to come address a joint session of Congress to try to blow up Obama's foreign policy, you know, that he like was completely disingenuous in his approach to the Palestinians for years. And it disappoints me that why that, you know, why that, I mean, that history should matter, you know? Um, and because a lot of, some of the positions they're taking Mm -hmm. depend upon mm -hmm. the, the idea that mm -hmm. the U.S. should stay out of things that should be dealt with through negotiations, right? Mm -hmm. So like I saw Tony Blinken, wonderful man, uh, rooting for success, mm -hmm. but say that the U.S. was going to keep our embassy in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. but we, we couldn't say whether we thought East Jerusalem would be part of uh, a Palestinian state, would be a capital of a Palestinian state. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, number one, there are no negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians happening now. So there's no reason that we can't address something because it has to be negotiated at this time. And secondly, John Kerry gave a speech saying as much, saying that East Jerusalem would be the capital of the Palestinian state at the end of the Obama administration. So there's a, which leads me to the last point, which is that it feels like we're in the defense of Crouch, the, 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 the typical, that these issues are shaped and framed and defined from the right that um, if you're a, a mainstream Democrat, not only are you expected to kind of take a set of positions, you're expected to apologize for the people to your left, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so instead of saying, you know what, I'm not going to tell some 19 year old kid mm -hmm. who, you know, is getting politically engaged in college, and is really upset by what he's learned about how Palestinians are treated. Right. Who maybe is a cousin of that guy in, in the West Bank who went through that hellish experience, who you met with. So he might yes. have some personal experience with it, right. Or he could even be Jewish. He could right. be a li right. liberal Jew right. who, right. Did, and he joined right. some group that wants right. the university to divest from, right. you know, whatever that's made in the settlements or something. Right. right. I'm not going to call that guy an anti-Semite right. just so that I can, you know, have a talking point at APAC. Mm -hmm. or uh, in some congressional hearing, like that's not fair. And that, and, and not only it's wrong, but it also allows this whole debate around Israel to be framed by Bibi Netanyahu and, and Mike Pompeo and Tom Cotton, you know? Mm -hmm. and, like we should have our own positions. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so again, so the, 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 less any one issue, what, what, what is, you know, would be concerning over time is this defensive kind of crouch on you know, bleeds into how they approach the Iran negotiations and what they say about the Palestinians. And, you know, uh, and, 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 you know, I think thus far with the, um, um, the campaign and, and to date, you know, that they, they've definitely tacked in that direction at a time when the Democratic caucus in Congress is becoming more progressive. Other Democratic candidates were willing to be more vocal in their criticism of certain Israeli government policies. Um, and it may be the case that they're thinking, well, it's the beginning of administration when we're trying to patch a past COVID relief bill, we're trying to fight a pandemic. The last thing we need right, is right. any static on Israel. Right. I totally get that mentality. Mm -hmm. At the same time, that's the same, there's always gonna be reason to have that mentality. Um, 
uh, it'll apply. A year, I guarantee you a year from now it'll apply because there's a midterm election. And then a year after that it'll apply because you're going for re-election. And so there's always a reason to, to just try to, to, to feel like it's just not worth the, the, the headache of, of deviating at all from a, a set of positions. Right. So I know you have to go soon, but the last question I want to ask is, you know, John Kerry gave a speech um, uh, a few years ago now where he basically said, you know, the two-state solution's got very little time left. I can't remember exactly how many, right? But we've passed the number, whatever number of years he said we had left, it's passed now, right? So there, there are a lot of, you know, I feel like the kind of elephant in the room in sometimes in these conversations is kind of like whether this two-state paradigm really still bears any relationship to the reality on the ground. And, um, uh, uh, you know, you were kind enough to retweet, I'm sure it made you super popular, uh, uh, a piece that I wrote, um, uh, you know, suggesting that we actually need to think about what always struck me as frankly the most natural thing for progressive Americans to support, which was basically, you know, a government where there was equality under the law for everybody, which is what we aspire to in the United States. And I'm just wondering, I guess I have two questions. First of all, do you sense that among people in democratic foreign policy circles, things like that there, you know, over a few drinks, you know, sort of Vuce, there is any actual openness to this conversation or actually talking about this conversation of like, what, what do we do if the two-state solution is no longer popular and we actually believe in liberal democratic values? And how far away do you think the Democratic Party is from that position if you think it would it could ever get to that position? So I, I think we're pretty far away in the sense that Peter, like, you know, even behind closed doors, mm -hmm. um, there's a set of talking points about a two-state solution that are talking points. And mm -hmm. what's really people striking- people believe them? Well, what's really interesting, because I was gonna say, what's striking to me about them is like, they they could have been written right after Oslo, right? But right. like they're so out of date, you know? Um, and I think people believe them. Mm -hmm. I really truly be think that people believe them, like thoughtful people. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, if you press on it, mm -hmm. um, you know, we had a presentation that we would give people with with the maps, you know, um, and, and showing basically how this was becoming impossible, a contiguous viable Palestinian state. And people kind of digest that and not really know what to say then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like they didn't know what was going to replace the talking points. Mm -hmm. um, and here's what's interesting to me, Peter, just unpack this. Uh, I always wished and maybe it's clarifying now, given the direction that Israeli politics has taken in the last few years, that the other side of this debate would just be honest, right? right? In other words, like, I always wish that the, the right or whatever you want to call it, because I think it probably encompasses some Democrats, frankly, would just say, we don't believe there should be a Palestinian state. We right. believe in the concept of a greater Israel. Right. We feel sorry for the Palestinians, but they're just going to have to deal with it because step by step, Ultimately, we believe that all this land right. uh, should be Israel and the Palestinians over time are going to have to just, you know, move into Jordan, be absorbed into Lebanon, Jordan. Some of them can stay in the Jewish state. That's the position right. of the Israeli government. Frankly, right. that's the position of the Republican Party, um, right. even if they right. don't. They're more honest about it, right? Yeah, they're more honest right. about it. You know, they move the embassy. Right. And I think that's the position of some conservative Democrats yeah, uh, yeah. who don't say that, but I think that they know what's happening, you know, and they've been playing this talking yeah. points around the two state solution and then blame the Palestinians for it never happening. Right, you know, right. I, I got so sick of hearing a uh, Palestinians yeah. never miss an opportunity to right. miss an opp opportunity. Right. It's like, well, when did we give them one? I mean, maybe, yeah. maybe right. Arafat had one at Camp David, right. you know, like, uh, and I know there are others people will like throw a right. bunch of history at me, but like, I can tell you we didn't really give them one when I was there, you know, not a real one, or right. the Israelis didn't, we, you know. Right. So, um, so, so point, first point is it has to be, there's not a broad consensus around a two-state solution. Mm -hmm. Like Bush said that when he wanted like Tony Blair's support for the Iraq war, like the, the, the Republican party and some of the Democratic party and certainly most of Israelis right. believe that there should not be a two-state solution. Right, know? they're one stater. right. Yeah, they're one staters <laughs> and we don't, act like that. We act like somehow Bibi Netanyahu believes in the two-state solution. And we pretended, right. to my shame at times in the Obama administration, like he w w was interested in that, when I don't think he was, ever. That's the first point. So, so what does it mean? I think that in the Democratic Party, um, there's, uh, there's, there's still this kind of, in the foreign policy establishment, um, there's still this kind of 
theology of the two-state solution. Um, that there's some formula at some point, like John, and John Kerry very much represents, John Kerry believes very deeply in the two-state solution. And he really believes that there's a formula, and I respect him for believing it, by the way, you know, I'm not being negative. He believes there's formulas of international support and negotiation and step-by-step -step processes and assurances to Israel. And I, I, I think it's harder and harder to see that. Um, and that at a minimum, the US should, and I, I long favored the US just putting out our positions on final status issues long before it carried it. Cause I think we needed to just lay down a marker. Like, here's what we think should be the case. It, you know, just so there's a kind of a record of like, you know, the, the goalposts have moved so much that so like this is actually what we think would have been fair or could be fair if we ever could get back to it. Um, and, and then I think that because the Biden administration is unlikely to do much in this space, unlikely to spend the next four years really trying to deal with this, because what's the point you know, from their perspective? that the Democratic Party's views are probably gonna evolve from within the caucus. And the progressives are gonna be, there's nowhere else for them to go intellectually probably than some kind of one state self-determination with democratic rights um, uh, 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 you know, set of ideas. Um, uh, I myself don't even know what, where I feel like I have to, you know, cause, cause I, my, what I thought were, my, my my radical position, right, of of, <laughs> of the U.S. taking positions, sta right. stating them uh, publicly, and frankly, be wi being willing to 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 pursue them at the United Nations, mm -hmm. um, which was totally radical in you know the mid er, you know early 2010s, is now pretty much out of date. You know, <laughs> um, um, so I myself have to f wrestle with this the next few years because I still believe that that it'd be the preferable to have two states. Um, but I have to wrestle with the reality that it's hard to see how that's, you know, how that's going to happen anytime soon, if ever. Yeah. Well, ben, but I, I really... think the last thing, the last thing yeah. I'd say, Peter, is that like the Palestinians are not going anywhere. There are millions yeah. of Palestinians. And, right. and I know that the other side of the debate can think, well, look, look, we're winning, you know, it's working. Right. And in many ways they're right, but right. at some point, like, uh, whether you know there's a there's not really many analogous po populations in the world to right. to the Palestinians like that that's there and right. something is going to continue to bring attention back to it and so this these debates as much as people would like the facts on the ground to just make them go away they're they're not going to go away right right exactly and you know even if even if Israel is winning I mean you know I spend a fair amount of time reading Torah and studying Talmud, I have not come across the verse that, that says that yes. the foundation of Judaism is might makes right, you know, like that's not a foundational principle um, of either, of either, of either, you know, of either liberal democracy or, or, or Jewish tradition as I see it. So it seems so to me like. I, I, and I'll end on one note yeah. from my book. So this will be my, my little book preview. Good, good. It's called After one, the Fall. After the Fall. So <laughs> I, I, and it looks at this rise of nationalism and authoritarianism around the world and how America was implicated in that. I was talking to a Hungarian um, uh, of Jewish origin, you know, um, like me, he's kind of like me. I think he's you know, half Jewish, very much identified mm -hmm. as, as a Jew, like mm -hmm. for history. I mean, his family, obviously, you know, Holocaust history in, in Hungary. Um, and we were talking about this phenomenon of, of, of Netanyahu being close to Viktor Orban. Right. Who right. is an anti-Semite, you right. know, um, but who backs Israel's policies on the Palestinians and other things. And, and I said, I was like, let me try to occupy Netanyahu's worldview, you know, like to show, you know, like maybe the view is Jews have been screwed throughout history by a corrupt, cruel world. Right. And so, you know what? We just have to be corrupt That's and cruel ourselves. That's right. the only way to survive in this world. And if That's I got to make friends with a guy like Orban, I'm going to do it. And, and look, meanwhile, I'm delivering to the Jewish people. I've got, you know, and, and you know, I've got the capital of Jerusalem recognized now in the United States. I'm pushing the Palestinians out and, and, and my, it's working. And right. this guy said to me, without batting an eye, he said, Ben, um, you know, a world in which ethno-nationalism is predominant is right. not a good world for the Jews. Right. And ultimately, whatever short-term gains are won right. uh, are, are, are lost in the long term. Right. Um, and, I, you know, that's worth remembering. Yeah, yeah. Ben, thank you so much for doing this. I really admire Thanks, and appreciate the way you wrestle with this stuff. Um, and uh, I know it's I know it's challenging for someone like you who's been in government. Um, so thank you. Thanks for doing this. 
Thanks, Peter. Take care. I hear a little, yeah. little voice by myself. No <laughs> See problem. you, man. Bye. Bye. Hi. What's your